May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another Kuk Audio Podcast. I'm D.C. Pubov, Kuk Audio and Kuk Archives, preserving the legacy of Shunryu Suzuki and those whose paths cross his. And anything else that comes to mind. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable, free from economic hardship, and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. So today we have a guest, Misty Brackett, uh, who uh, came to Zen Center in... uh, 1979, and um, she's going to tell us about her experience there, her experience since, and I don't know, talk about a few things here and there. And um, uh, I really enjoy, I always enjoy talking to Misty. So um, uh, you'll you'll learn about her in the podcast. There's no need to say any more. Uh, so uh, after our pause to meditate, we'll give Misty a call. So when you uh, hear the bell, hit pause if you're of such a mind and meditate or whatever for as long as you want. And when you're ready to come back, hit unpause. And we'll be here to hit the bell to end the meditation or whatever. And uh, we'll give Misty that call. We're connecting, I see. I'm not calling you on my phone. You know what I mean? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, but anyway, yes. here we are. We, we're, here we are. We have succeeded in connecting. <laughs> uh, so, Misty, hey, it's been a while since I talked to you, maybe 40 years or something. Or... Yeah. <laughs> What's 40 years <laughs> friends? <laughs> uh, so... Uh, uh, what are you up to there in uh, B- B- Boulder? Well, northwest of Boulder, Lyons, much smaller town. Mm-hmm. Um, well, let's see. I got married for the first time at sixty, so oh, that's I'm having great. That sort of diff- yeah, that sort of different experience. Well, tell me about so, that. I want to hear. Well, so. I married a man who's lost two wives to cancer, both quickly. So, but that that grief field is a very familiar field to me. So I jumped right in. I got two stepdaughters and two, and now three granddaughters in the process. And you know, really, some part of me knew. Like I never felt like I really wanted to have kids, but. I definitely wanted to be a grandma, and I'm a great grandma. <laughs> so that's good. That's good. So and, you know, not, not everybody can manage not having children and still being a grandmother, but I managed to pull it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's neat. That's really neat. And so, what's he like? Well. He's very linear. He's a retired civil engineer, not spiritual at all. You know, this is all that sort of, you know, hoo-ha stuff that I like, but (laughs) yeah, he's not into. So, you know, I was a year and three quarters past a brain injury from a rollover accident. Oh. And he was nine weeks past the loss of his second wife. So it's, it's. 
definitely a marriage based in survival rather than in anything higher than that. Mm -hmm. But it's also, you know, I have other friends I can be spiritual and psychological with, but I didn't have someone to hang out with and eat with and go to movies with and play with. So now I have a playmate. Yeah. Well, he's just on a different type of spiritual path. We're all on spiritual paths. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> if you have the sort of outlook that you and I have, that's true. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, he just eliminated all the nonsense and not thinking about it. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, and we have a beautiful, beautiful house that, um, you know, this whole area is crazy um, real estate. But my old house I lived in for 16 years and it doubled in value. This house we've lived in for eight years and it's doubled in value. Yeah. Yeah. So we couldn't we couldn't afford this house <laughs> now. Yeah, I, I, but it's a beautiful house. Yeah, and that's a fun thing to get to live in a beautiful house once in your life. Ah, ah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's neat. Well, um, uh, what brought you to Boulder? How long have you been in Boulder? Well, so this is interesting and sort of part of my story, starting with moving to San Francisco for to practice at Zen Center, all of my geographic moves have been for spiritual teachers or work. Oh. Well let's hear about it. You can you can start anywhere you want. All right. Well so well I think you know my my story of how I came to Zen Center is a little different from other people's because many people didn't meet Richard Baker at their family Thanksgiving uh -huh. or family Christmas dinner, but I'm Virginia Baker's cousin, or actually second cousin. Our dads were cousins, but because they lived in the greater St. Paul, Minneapolis area, I saw them more than I did some people that were my, you know, more regular cousins. Oh, so, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, so we were just having... You know, Thanksgiving or Christmas, I can't remember which. And, you know, Richard Baker just said, oh, you should come to San Francisco. And, you know, because I didn't know him that well, I took it as a personal invitation, not something that he probably says to everybody. Uh -huh. But um, <laughs> I did come for a visit that spring and just fell in love with everything about Zen Center and Green Gulch and so, what year was that? I, oh, good Christ. Um, let's say, oh, it was 1979. Is that right? Because of, yeah, because it was right when Greens opened, because I worked at Greens right when it opened. Oh, me too. We were together. Yeah, so. <laughs> so, yeah, so then I moved out there you know the first night I pulled into Green Gulch because that's where Ginny and Richard lived and um Ginny was like oh well you know change your clothes we're having some people for dinner and and it included Governor Brown and his girlfriend at the time Linda Ronstadt so <laughs> you know I'm I'm brushing my teeth at the kitchen sink because I was going to stay out in the little wing where Nakamura sensei lived oh, yeah. and there wasn't a bathroom there. The back room, so I was, yeah. you know, there I am brushing my teeth at the kitchen sink and, you know, actually maybe they weren't at dinner, but, you know, in comes Governor Brown and Linda Ronstadt and I'm like, okay. <laughs> hmm. No one's going to believe this, but it did happen because they were going to sleep in the tea room. Anyway. Oh, so that's neat. That was my introduction and um, I just, you know, I was always very smart, like I always did really well in school, sort of effort, effortlessly. And even in college, when I was sort of having a nervous breakdown, I still got on the dean's list. Uh -huh. So that sort of achievement came very easy to me. 
but when I came to Zen Center, it was the first time I wanted something and was drawn to something that I wasn't very good at. And, you know, I have maintained <laughs> that the whole 40 plus years of practice. I'm still not a very good meditator, you know, but I do do better meditating in a group. Um, uh, do, do you, is there any group you're around now? You know, there's not a, a particular practice group. I've been involved in a number of different groups. But right now, the biggest draw for me is a storytellers group on Facebook led by Dr. Bertice Berry. And, you know, it's a different angle, but it it sort of hits the right notes for me mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. working on racism indirectly. So she's this amazing black woman, and every morning she posts a story. And then she also has a storytellers group where those of us who want to tell our own stories can tell stories. And it's very powerful. And so that's, that's my current practice group, as well as painting. I started painting probably 15 or so years ago, maybe 14. And I have a group in boulder that i practice with every wednesday afternoon we paint together and they both um well actually lisa's a zen practitioner and john practice at shambhala center so there's definitely a a vein of buddhism through my whole life and john bales married us no kidding no kidding yeah, that's really neat. And, and when, yeah, it was really neat. When did you get married? We got married in October of 2014. Hmm. Hmm. So when I had reconnected with John, so I was in on Facebook, so I was in a spiritual work group where I went to New York three times a year. And so one of the times that I was in New York, he was in transit from, I can't remember where, maybe someplace in New Jersey back to Boston. And so we met and had tea. And then he got uh, priesthood. And so, you know, I was very lucky when we were gonna get married. I had, you know, three different people that I could think of you know, who could marry us, but John was my first choice. So he came out here. And so that was a lovely tie in. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. That's neat. <laughs> well, um, uh, what, you know, I thought I could remember you further back than 79. Uh, I was surprised when you said that. Uh, huh. That's really interesting because you were you were close with uh, with uh, D D D D Diane. Diane, my my yes. first wife, yes. and and well, that was because we lived together in San Francisco, but that was after I came to Zen Center. But I think that's probably why because I was good friends with her and with Margaret Crowley. And so your ties with them go way back before 79. Oh, well, what do you mean? You were, you do go back before 79. No, because I lived with them after I was at Zen Center in San Francisco, and then we moved together to Spokane. But that was after I was at Zen Center. But your your relationships with them predate 79 so that's probably why you think you knew me from before because i'm in the file with diane and margaret. margaret right so 79 is the first year you were that you and i could have met yep huh huh oh that's interesting right right um uh and um so how long were you uh, did you you lived at Green Gulch starting off, right? I lived at Green Gulch that first summer and worked. Um, did I work? I 
no, I don't think I did work at Greens that first summer. I don't think so. I think I worked at Green Gulch, but then when it became clear that I wasn't just Ginny's cousin visiting, that I actually wanted to practice, then I moved into the city and then I worked at Greens. Got my ass kicked, but... <laughs> what do you mean, got your ass kicked? Well, I mean, you know, working at Greens was big practice. And at first I was a runner, which I think is the hardest job because you're out on the floor and the customers don't know that you're not a server. So they say, well, could I get a cappuccino? And so then you have to find their server and tell them that someone at table 54 wants a cappuccino. And then you go into the kitchen and the kitchen crew is like, run this, run that, take, you know, so everybody wants something of you. So at one, one day I ended up crying out behind the dumpster and Baker Roshi sent Renee out to talk to me. And then I became the dishwasher. So I did kitchen prep in the morning and was the dishwasher. And I loved being the dishwasher. That was my favorite job. Me too. Because I was, yeah, queen of my area. I could hurry up and do some stuff fast and then have a little break. You know, I loved that. That was a much better yeah. position. You know, because you guys were all trained Zen students who, you know, and probably had done summers at Tassajara and stuff. I'd never done that kind of work before. And and it's almost like, I, like I'm too conscientious or something. Like I couldn't let go of stuff and just go on to the next thing. So that was, you know, a good part of my practice. Uh-huh, uh-huh, <laughs> uh-huh, yeah. Enjoy the dishwasher. Yeah. But I, I live, so I lived in the neighborhood at first, and then I lived in the building for two and a half years. And then I lived in the neighborhood again for, I don't know, a little while. And then I moved up off of Hate Street, up more towards, because I still was working at Elia. Oh, Alaya, and and what was Alaya? Uh, uh, Karen Jording was was uh, running it. Yep, Karen and Wendy Johnson. It was at first. Well, first I worked sewing zafus and futons and stuff, and then when we closed the sewing shop, um, but that was my original connection to Alaya was the sewn goods. But then Karen and Wendy took it over and made it more of a clothing store. So then I worked for them. Uh huh. Uh, did uh, uh, were were you there in the fat pant era? Fat pants. <laughs> that makes me laugh. I know. I know. I think I came in at, on the end of the fat pant era. Um, that you, do you know who turned us on to fat pants? Fat pants were really big, and they're sort of no, like they were really big. Oh no, they were still a thing when I came. Yeah. Uh, yeah who turned you? Who turned us on to fat fat uh, pants? Paul Reps, the the oh, who, right. who uh, put together uh, Zim Flesh and Zim Bones uh, back way back. Um, God, I don't know when that book came out. Uh, I'll look it up. But uh, he was really something, and uh, so he turned us on to fat pants, and uh, yeah, they were great. But they were so good for sitting in because they were loose. They were sort of yeah. like Chinese yeah. pants or something, you know? Yeah. yeah. And who was the tie to Kalita? I, Swiss or Austrian? Swiss, I think. Oh, you mean Mary Shannon? No, it was a man. Kalita. Oh, Vanya Palmer's, of course, his family, he, his family owns it. No, I was saying, I yes. forgot what Kalita was. Kalita's like the Hanes of Switzerland yes, and but much better. Germany. Underwear, nightgowns, yes, turtlenecks. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a big empire, uh, clothing empire. I think there was a woman named Mary Shannon that came out and helped with something. Oh, maybe that was more like the bakery. She was into design yeah, and stuff. She was one of the sort of, I thought of her as one of the East Coast Society ladies that were mm -hmm. involved with Zen Center and uh, and our upper middle way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well put, well put. 
Do you have any specific memories of Green Gulch, the city center? Uh, oh, I have a great memory of Green Gulch. Early on, um, Lou Richmond was, was he the Tonto or head of practice? Anyway, he had some. And so we had work meeting and I, you know, I got my degree in elementary education. I'd done child care. And so the work leader said, Misty, you're going to be with the kids today. So, you know, whatever, and 15 minutes later, you meet in the dining room. So I was there, and there was Lou. And Lou said, I'm going to take the kids today. And I go, but but I, I'm happy to do it. And I don't remember whether he told me then or he told me later, but he said, you're very new to practice And if anything happened to any of the kids, it might ruin your chance at practice. So he was protecting me. So I I always remember that as such a, you know, like, like the highest good was protecting my right and, you know, path to practice mm-hmm. rather than having someone with some experience taking care of the kids that day. Ah. Uh. So, and then, and I remember one time I was on breakfast duty at city center and you came in, I think you were going to Tassajara or something and you, you picked up a whole egg shell and all and put it in your mouth and ate it. <laughs> or oh, a raw egg. Yeah, you probably have no memory of that. Oh, no, I I used to do that. I remember that. Yeah. You probably did it for the shock. Value, yeah, but I just did it to blow people's minds. But it worked. It, you know. It's really not hard to eat. 40 plus years later. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, once you know you can do it, uh, it's not that hard. And, and uh, yeah. you know, most people is that, just think it, it would shock them. And I enjoyed shocking people. Uh, I you know. I remember when Thich Nhat Hanh came to Green Gulch. Yeah, and even then, I could tell what a privilege it was, you know, to sit in that zendo and hear him talk. Mm. Um, I remember one time at City Center with Katagiri Roshi. Oh. He was talking, and of course, you remember, he had still had a fairly thick accent, so it was hard to understand right away. But he said, you are just the leftovers. You are just the doggy bag. (laughs) And it just, you know, again. And so I guess the strongest thing and, and what got me to practice was when I came to Zen Center there was this huge release of energy because it was like, oh, what I've believed but never put into words, here's a religion, a practice that's been going for over 2,000 years that is just what I feel, just what I believe. Uh And... And that was, I mean, I was raised Episcopalian and I was in the choir, so I was at church a lot. But I remember specifically one time when I was 16, because in the choir, you know, the altars at one end and the two sides of the choir face each other. But when you say the Nicene Creed, you turn and face the altar. And, you know, I've done it since I was a child, so I just knew it by heart. And I turned and I heard the words that I was saying. I believe in one Catholic and apostolic church. And I was like, no, I don't. I don't even know what that means and the rest of it. And so even though I kept going to church and stayed in the choir, I never said that out loud again. Mm. So it struck me that, you know, I didn't, none, none of the teachings or sermons or anything that I'd been shown in the Episcopalian church found a place that resonated with me or that, you know, felt like something that would inspire me or, Mm -hmm. you know, bring more depth to my life. And so 
when I got to Zen Center, that's what I found. Mm. And so that's really, you know, all of the other spiritual work groups that I've been in involved meditation. And, you know, if I have to check a religion on a sheet, I still check Buddhist because that's the closest. Yeah. You know, so that was something that even though I only actively practiced for five or six years, really created a basis for the rest of my life. Right, right. Um, that's, you know, uh, people would say to me when I wasn't living in Zen Center, oh, oh when did you stop practicing? <laughs> I'd yeah. say, well, you, like that can happen. You, you don't have to be... Uh, at Zinson or with a group to be involved in having a uh, uh, a spiritual practice or a Buddhist practice or something like that. I'd say it's like yeah. it's like saying to somebody who went to college and then they left college and went somewhere else, saying, "Oh, when did you stop getting an education <laughs> or whatever?" Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Exactly. Yeah, and I, 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 um, I didn't like the idea of, uh, and in fact, it's pretty strong in Japan too. If if somebody is like a monk in in a temple uh, for fifteen years, and they decide to leave, they're a quitter. <laughs> oh, <wow>. Yeah, <laughs> and of course that's what people on the inside would tend to say. Not everybody. Uh, yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, you know, so, so what is this practice we're talking about? What what would you say? What would I say? I would say it's developing a capacity for mindfulness, which would be awareness. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, starting with just the awareness of my body, where's my body in space, what's going on in my body. That's good. You know, that's good. Very, very simple. Um, yeah. And then spreading, you know, so in the morning we would sit facing in. So that was to me more representative of looking inside myself and in the afternoon we'd sit facing out to me sort of signifying that then my awareness could you know move outside myself to my surroundings to other people and so and I think I mean I'm sure like many people who choose a vocation or a spiritual or religious practice in life many people that choose Zen have some sort of natural proclivity for it that it lines up with, even though, as I've said, you know, sitting was always a challenging practice for me, but the gestalt of Zen felt very familiar to me uh -huh. and felt like, um, uh -huh. so I, I think, and, and, you know, this may be my creative license, but to me, it feels like, just like, um, you can be raised Jewish, but there's also a Jewish culture. You know, you can practice Zen, but there's also a Zen culture. So I feel a lot of affinity with Zen culture. Yeah. Even though my cluttered counters <laughs> would beg to differ. <laughs> yeah. And but but just with that, not just with the physical aesthetic but but just that view of how the world works you know and that view of taking care of other people and doing no harm mm. Um, mm. I always say do as doing as little harm as possible Yes, well, th that's true because we all do harm every day, don't yes. we? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I resonated much more with the precepts than with the Ten Commandments. They seemed much more, even if, 
you know, some of the end ideas are the same thing. The precepts were put much more in the way that I would put them if I were yeah. writing something like that. Yeah, well, the Ten, ten so Commandments have that, some, uh, some uh, they're, 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 they have some cultural stuff in them, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, that's bound to a particular time and culture. And it uh, really doesn't uh, necessarily all uh, translate well at other times. <laughs> I was thinking when I asked you, uh, what, what is this practice? Uh, I thought, God, am I glad I'm not a teacher, a Buddhist teacher, having to what? figure out what to <laughs> say. <laughs> exactly. You know? you know, and I think that, you know, I think, I mean, I thought about not being a Buddhist teacher because I didn't even make it to Tassajara. That was sort of a cutting off point for me. Um, you know, of being a therapist or, um, and I just, yeah, it's never, it just felt like I got enough on my own plate. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> not yeah. Going there. But, you know, I pick up, um, you know, whenever I pick up Tricycle, there's at least one article, at least, by someone that I practice with at Zen Center. Yeah. You know, and so I see how everybody has gone off. And, you know, Facebook was a huge gift to me after my brain injury because I couldn't be out in the world because light and sound were very, it was too much for me. So that was really a way I connected. And that was sort of right when, a lot of people were getting on Facebook. And so I'm friends with a number of people that I practiced with at San Francisco Zen Center. You know, John Bale, um, Harper Lee, Kai. Oh, wow. Harper. Yeah. Harper, yeah. Um, Amy Diller that I shared an apartment with. You know, it's just wonderful to have these connections hmm. that go through time and space and, you know, tie me to these people that, you know, we all shared this very deep practice. Yeah, because Harper, also someone that I shared an apartment with. Huh. Were you at Green's when she was cooked there? That's a good question. I think that would have been before I lived with her. So, but I have a vague memory of that. You know, I was there when Deborah was there and then when Annie took over. Well, wait a minute. Annie didn't take over straight from Deborah Harper was between them. Oh, she was. So maybe, so maybe there she was. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, and also because I did the children's night and did the child care, you know, across the street for children of priests and senior students. So there's a whole nother realm of kids that I'm friends with on Facebook. Yeah. You know. Now, when you um, say. Children, uh, priests, and senior students. I'd say anybody that was there that had a kid that needed to be taken care of that had some practice at Zen Center could be eligible, right? I'm not sure for the child care. Certainly for children's dinner that I also did, that was very true. But mostly the kids that came to the daycare, so it was... Jessamine Meyerhoff, Joda, Jonah Simino, Ariana Kaiser, Audrey Haller. Um, yeah, oh, that's, yeah, uh, that's all, they're all like a, a little later Karuna era. Tanahashi. Yeah, so they were all, yeah. Yeah. A little more. Yeah. I, and that might have just been, you know, I mean, it was a limited, a limited space, and I was the only caretaker, so, you know, they might have sort of, but I'm friends with, Almost all those kids on Facebook. Oh, that's wonderful. And, you know, and Linda Hess, Linda came to Boulder, I don't know, one, maybe five years ago and stayed at our house. Oh, is that right? She said, I'd like to is see that right? Yeah, she said, I'd like to see you. And I go, that's great. You know, where are you staying in Boulder? She goes, no, I'd like to stay with you. I'm like, that's even better. Come on up. Oh, that's <laughs> great. That's great. Huh. Yeah. But, and I just, so... I was in this other spiritual work group and 
it was a whole bunch of people on a Zoom call, and I kept seeing the name Kim Kaiser, and of course thought that was a unique name and remembered that I knew someone, but I maybe he didn't have a picture up. He certainly wasn't live, or I couldn't. I think I couldn't make it big enough, and there were hundreds of people. So you know, on each page of people, it was you know like a half inch, and like I couldn't quite tell. Yeah. But so I reached out to the organizer and said, I used to know someone named Kim Kaiser at San Francisco Zen there. Could you reach out to him and see if 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 it's the same one? And so it was. And so, yeah, he and I had a nice long talk. And I visited Betsy and Ken a few years ago. Oh, wow. Chuck and I did. Uh, yeah. House and you know Chris Chris Fortin came over and, and as did Elin and her mother I made her so yeah Zen Center is very woven through my life. Yeah, no kidding. You're really covering a, a lot of people I'm close with there too. <laughs> um, I wonder what that what yeah. was that group yeah. that Kent Kim Kaiser was in. He got heavily. He and Joyce got heavily involved in the. What's it called? Uh, actually, I used to go to it some uh, for the music, and Elon sang in their choirs from the Church of Religious Science. Or, is that what it was? Oh, no, it okay, changed to the Center for Spiritual Living or something like that in uh, uh, Santa yeah. Rosa, California. I don't, know much. Yeah. I don't know much about that part, but he was, there's a philosopher, Robert James, that this person, Jeff Carrera, who I, he was a teacher in a group that I was in, and then the two teachers split off, but I have done other stuff with Jeff, so it was in a Jeff Carrera um, Zoom call, mm. because Jeff's also very into Robert James, and so he and he and Kim talked about that. Mm. Mm. Wow. <laughs> the world... The world's very small. <laughs> yeah, I'm not familiar with with uh, uh, those. Uh, two. You might, you would like Jeff, I think. Look, look him up sometime. Yeah, you know, there's he's written a number of books, but I, I so yeah, so I was I did the Diamond Approach or Diamond Heart. Or oh Ridley yeah, yeah. Um, uh, they wanted could Italy. yeah could drink uh, my uh, my beloved wife. Yes, your wife. Uh, uh, was involved in trying to set up a diamond, what's it called, diamond? Diamond heart or red one, diamond approach. Yeah, uh, here in Bali. And uh, uh, finally it was set up uh, and uh, with the help of someone else, uh, they were very particular in what they wanted. And then finally they canceled. Uh, oh, I, bad. Uh, I, and uh, Paul Rosenblum's wife is very involved in that. Yes, yes, he is. Yes, she is. She's a teacher in that. And so, and Wayne Pickrell's then wife was also involved in it. So I have seen Wayne over the years when I would see Linda. So, you know, yeah, small well, world. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I get this picture with you. I mean, uh, one would tend to think, oh, oh, Misty, she's in Colorado or somewhere. She's way over there. You're very involved with uh, the community of people that came through the San Francisco Zen Center. You, you've, you've, yeah, well. you've uh, I can just see all these strings going from you <laughs> yeah. to all these people yeah. that they go to me. Um, mm -hmm. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. Uh, and the um, what I think of Cuke Archives as. Uh, People tend to see what I do as uh, uh, just uh, archiving uh, Shunyu Suzuki stuff, but I see it as uh, like this big holographic um, picture of uh, of who whose lives were touched by Shunyu Suzuki uh, when mm -hmm. he was alive and afterwards, and it sort of expands out to. Uh, all space and time, but <laughs> I try to keep it somewhat more narrowly focused, but still uh, pretty wide. It's really disseminated uh, 
out there in so many ways because so many because it wasn't a, a true believing thing. Uh, yes. And people at Zen Center uh, were uh, very frequently, uh, many people were involved in other things, interested in other teachers. There were other Zen groups that uh, uh, really had a more closed uh, system that scoffed it. Even other Zen teachers is not being the true way. Uh, and um, uh, that always sort of turned me off. Uh, well, I'm, I'm in the same camp as you yeah. are. Yeah. Um, and I loved being at a Zen Center in a place where, you know, somebody could come in and say, well, your teacher's not really enlightened. He's not really dumb. our teacher, and so we go. Yeah, well, that, yeah, it might be true, but uh, you know, I like the food here or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I have my own eight by ten room, so I'm good. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well. Um, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I like the the. You know, I have this uh, talking with you has just given me this feeling of this extended network extending into uh, in in subtle ways and gross ways here and there, uh, and not never really having a cutoff point. Sort of like the atmosphere. Uh, there yeah. are, are if you want to say, where does the solar system end? Uh, that's a really hard thing to define. I mean, they do have uh, some agreements, uh, but um, and wh where does the atmosphere in is it sort of dissipated? Yeah. But there are uh, ideas where the atmosphere officially ends, and whether Jeff Bezos made it out of it or not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wait, was he in outer space or inner space? Um, that's for other minds. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, trying to figure out or care about. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, um, uh, but let me ask you one other thing. What 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 did okay. you do when you went to Boulder? So, and why did you go to Boulder? <laughs> well, I went to Boulder. So from San Francisco. Daya, Diane, and Margaret Shakti, and I, and a couple other people were in this, this small oh, yeah. sort of Gurdjieffing with Renee oh, Ray. Right, of course. And, yeah. So we we all moved to Spokane together, and then after a number of years, that group disbanded. And so I heard these two gurus were they were based in Boulder, but for some reason they were coming to Spokane to teach a three-month course. I mean, go figure. The universe is so random as it comes to find you and show you your path. So I did that three-month course with them, and I really liked them. And so then I decided to move to Boulder. Is that the one that is, is that, that uh, Margaret went with and changed her name yes. to Shakti? Yes, yes. And I think, that, I mean, I haven't seen her in a number of years, but the last I heard, she was still with with the woman guru, the, 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 ma the male guru and the female guru broke up. So they were a couple and then they broke up. And so, but the female guru continued that path. But, you know, I was only in that for a couple of years and then realized like, no, that's not it for me. Yeah. Because it's always easier to just close your eyes and go to the blue black, black space. But then, what happens when the rubber meets the road? What happens when you open your eyes and you're out in the world? That's what I needed to practice for, uh, not for, you know, uh, going off into myself. Huh. <laughs> huh. Yeah. Uh, did, did, they, did that group have some sort of dance or something they did? Art group would... Not, in, not as part of the practice. They might have had spiritual movement. They might have done. I mean, I remember that. Well, what I, Kelly told me a story. I, I think it might be the same group. Were they sort of psychic type? Uh, 
there, there's an element of that, yes. Yeah, uh, all right. So there was some group that came in there, and I associate it with something that uh, Daya was checking out, and Margaret and you. And, uh, you know, he wasn't really interested in it, but he said there was some, and, and this might be different. Uh, he said there was some sort of, you know, thing where they Everybody was dancing in a room sort of by themselves, dancing and this and that. And that uh, he said he, he wasn't really interested in it. He was pretty young at the time. Uh, and uh, But he he was a teenager, at least, I'd say. Uh, and, yes, uh, that, that would have been about right. The, uh, he said the woman guru came up and, like, put her hand on his back and it, like, transformed his consciousness at the time yeah shocked him and yeah. uh yeah that that would have been right because he was 12 when we moved to to spokane so that would have been the timing would have been right for him to have been a, a teenager yeah she had some good you know good good spiritual juju that's for sure yeah yeah he's doing great he's doing great um uh, hmm and then all right so you you were in Spokane. What did you do for a living? So for a little while, so there was a great ceramic studio at the YMCA in Spokane. So for a year, I made ceramics and did art shows and sold my ceramics. But I quickly realized that making ceramics was this beautiful, creative outlet, and I didn't want to have it governed by the voice in my head that was saying what would sell. Mm -hmm. So I thought I'd rather just be a checkout clerk at Safeway and just keep that sacred. So, yeah, I understand um, that. I do. Yeah. So at that point, so the man who ran the ceramic studio, his wife worked across the parking lot at a framing studio. So I learned to frame and so can, so I've been a custom framer for, 30 years. Oh, all right. I was wondering. Oh, really? Yeah, so I alternated. When I came to Boulder, I alternated. I did I did manage a uh, chiropractic and massage office for a little while, but I've mostly alternated child care and custom picture framing because I had another little school in Boulder. I had someone that was in that same spiritual group that Shakti was in knew me from there. And so when she had a child asked me if I'd take care of her daughter. And when her daughter turned one, she said, well, I'd like you to keep taking care of her, but it'd be nice if there was other kids. So they got three other parents of kids who were in their same birth group. Mm -hmm. And I had a little four kid school and one of the parents it moved, but in one of the parents' basements, for three years. So I had these kids for when they were one, two, three, and four. And actually we broke them up the year before they were going to go to kindergarten. Cause we thought if they had another year together, they'd be just too powerful, a gang of four, but yeah, I'm huh. so that's another whole group of kids at a younger level than my Zen center kids that I'm also all friends with on Facebook, wow. you know, that have this big connection. Wow. Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, you hear so much negative stuff about Facebook, and it's true. I I, I think uh, Facebook is is uh, guilty of of inciting terrible, terrible things around the world. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, but that's not my experience with it. Mine is it's very useful. Uh, I don't feel like I waste time there. Uh, there's definite things I do. I'm not involved in any uh you know rancorous conversations or anything i don't i don't get involved in any politics uh it's rather it, anyway works very well i'm i think it's terrible though the the uh <coughs> the way you know it's gravitated toward uh polarizing and inciting violence and uh helping to overthrow uh governments and stuff i mean it's just um uh anyway maybe i don't know any government i mean there have been some things where 
whole elections have turned by using that sort of social media like to get mm-hmm. kids to make it hip not to vote, young people. Uh, and you get the right thing going, and then uh, uh, you can change who's going to win. Uh, okay. Um, hey, th- 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 tell me the name of the group that you came out there with. Well, it's had a variety of groups. Um, as has the the female teacher. I don't know what its current name is. Oceana was her name, and I'm trying to. I can't remember the name of the group. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. So if oh. somebody wanted to look it up or check on it, if if you write Oceana on Google, would something happen? I'll try it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that's good. All right. Well, look, uh, Misty, very good. I appreciate it. That it's been really good talking with you. I've, I've really enjoyed. I always enjoyed talking with you. Um, I, I. Well, that's very good. Yeah. Oh, I did. I always thought you were refreshing, and uh, you know, you didn't. You you had your own mind. Uh, uh, people tend to fall into. Um, uh, you know, group think and stuff like that. Uh, and it's impossible not to, but. Yes, I'm not immune, that's yeah. for sure. But I also, I also am a bracket from Minnesota. Right, so. right. How are you? Now, Lynn is, <laughs> Lynn is Jenny's little brother, right? Brother. So yeah. you're related to him, too. I want to do a podcast with him. Yeah, he'd be great. Yeah, he's really interesting. He'd be great. I, I just admire some uh, so much what he's done. Lynn Bracken. Uh, I do Jenny, but I know she wouldn't do it. I know Jenny. She's private. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't want. She wouldn't have. She wouldn't get near it. Uh, and and there's too much. Uh, too much. Uh, difficult history there for her. Uh, yeah. Well, I get that. I get that. I was in. In Boulder at the outdoor mall, and I'm pretty sure I saw Richard Baker across the street. And boy, I sure didn't want to say hello. So, oh, really? Why? <laughs> yeah, and that's fine because that's you know certainly you know based on my familial connection with him as well as my experience with him as a teacher. I mean, really, I had very little contact with him. I had more connection with Reb, you know, because I took care of Taya. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's an interesting thing. You can include this as you see fit, but probably, I don't know, five, six years ago, the phone rang and it was Rusa. Oh. My mind was blown. She goes, I've thought about you and I've thought about calling you for many years, but she goes, do you remember when Reb and I, I think they went to Europe, and you and Robert Lytle took care of Taya. Mm-hmm. And I said, yeah, I remember that. She goes, you knew that it was going to be so impactful on Taya having me gone, but she said, I didn't know that. And I've always wanted to thank you because you took care of Taya so well, and, and you know, you understood something about her that I didn't understand then. So I was like, okay, mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's nice. That's very nice. It was, but it was very, very sweet. Yeah, you know, very touching. Yeah. To. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, that was true. You know, Rusa hadn't been a mom before. She didn't understand that about kids, and you know, she still had. I mean, she had that sort of strict Chineseness about her that I'm sure you know many people saw. And so now there's someone who's. You know, and I know nothing really about her life except that I had that experience. And so that feels like someone who really has softened and grown through their proximity to Zen Center. Mm. 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 Um, you know, but yeah, I, I had much more contact with them than I ever did with 
Richard Baker, because he was a lot of times at Tassajara and I was never at Tassajara except as a, you know, summer guest student a little bit. Oh, but, well, you were there. Well, I went, you know, and worked a little in the summer, but I didn't do a practice. Well, period. that's all right. Um, <laughs> it's not required. <laughs> no. no, and one time when I was visiting Wayne Pickerel, we just decided to drive up to Tassajara for the day and sort of, you know, we didn't make reservations or do any of the things you're supposed to do, but they let us come in and I got to see Sarah Nancy Weintraub, who was another one of my kids from my little preschool, Aww. you know, so. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so, I th you know, for me, these connections with these kids were very rich, both at kids dinner and, and at the little daycare I had. And yeah, I mean, I reached out to Jessamine Meyerhoff I don't know, it was probably five years ago now, but I just said, hi, Jessamine, it's Misty. Do you remember me? And she goes, Misty? The Misty? Mm. <laughs> that was so sweet. Mm. That, you know, and, but I saw the Meyerhoffs, um, Keith and Leslie, when we went through Jamestown. I James think, Berg. You know, and of course, James Berg, sorry. Um, they remembered me. Of course, but yeah, just I, I just mostly I have such sweetness in my rem memories of people from Zen Center, even people that I didn't know very well, you know, like Lucy Calhoun and oh my gosh, who was married to Michael Sawyer? Um, uh, uh, Emma. Uh, Emma. Em yeah. Emma. Uh, yeah. Evelyn. No, not Emma. I, she, Emma Palmer's? We, yeah, she, we, both, we know. We, we know who we mean. Yeah, but yeah. God, I mean, contact so that, you know, with her. Um, yeah. Sometimes. Uh, oh, Emma. I can't remember either, but you're, you, we're, we're remembering her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, and as I said, I'm a up a tricycle, you know, Gil Franzberg. Franzdale. Franzdale. Gil Franzdale. And there's a number of other people. Daniel, I can't remember his last name, but all sorts of people, you know, that I practice with. It's like, oh, you know, if I'd stuck with it and Zen was really, you know, I could be a Zen teacher now, but I'm just as happy. But like my painting friend just was a Shuso, and so I sat around talking with her about her talks that she was going to give, you know? Uh-huh. Oh, so Zen's still very present in my life, you know, just, you know, not as a specific visible daily practice, but it feels like definitely part of my foundation uh -huh. and something that, that really grounded me into life. I had felt very lightly tethered to this life, and so finding Zen practice and Zen philosophy made me feel like there was a place for me on this earth, that I belonged here. There, I would find my people. I mean, I had found some of my people, and I would continue to find my people. <laughs> yeah. So and that's a very, very big thing, you know, when you look at teen and young adult suicide, and I think a lot of it comes from that not feeling grounded not having found your people not knowing how to find your people and so i will am thankful to richard baker for that oh you should come out to san francisco come out to visit you know said very easily and it changed my life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah oh, that's good that's yeah. good. I'm, now I'm trying to think yeah. of Emma's name. Is it Emma Haller? Uh, yeah, Emma. That's it. It's Emma. Yeah, I think. No, Paul Haller. So. Well, that might be. She was Palmer's. Emma. No, it's Emma Heller. That's it. I don't know. You'll have to look in your friends. You'll have to look in your address book uh, after we get off. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, yeah, I, I have so to write her sometimes. Wendy Johnson, oh my God, you know. Yeah. I mean, it was a huge 
you know, sort of outside influence just because she was practicing. She had a young son when I was at Green Gulch. Just, you know, all those people is just all so lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's you know, great. And all of the, that's... all the left handers working in the kitchen at Greens. I mean, uh, they're a high, highly disproportionate number of left handed people, myself being one of them. Oh, really? In the Greens kitchen. Michael Gelfond. Yeah. Huh. You know, it's just, I mean, like, I think like three of the four sort of head chefs and a number of us underlings like that's another poll do the math just way disproportionate number of left-handed people practice zen <laughs> oh wow that's interesting i've never heard that uh that's very interesting well we're operating from the right sides of our brain huh it's a different patient to life yeah you're like a different species uh <laughs> we, are, we are like a different uh, that's great that's great well it has been a great pleasure speaking with you um and um Wise. if uh, you come to bali please uh look us up <laughs> <laughs> well it's a place i'd love to come so i <laughs> that's not just an empty invitation i'll keep you in mind yeah 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 no 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 yeah. Uh, and, um, uh, I don't know if I'll ever be in Boulder, but if I am, I'll, uh, oh God, I know so many people in Boulder. We have guests, but we'd love to, well, I'm sure you do. Like you could just, you know, be here for a month and stay at a different place every night. Yeah, but, that's true. You know, uh, this is a lovely little town, just about 15 minutes Northwest of Boulder, but it's just a little town of 2000. Very. Someone once coined the phrase that fits it perfectly: a little bit Mayberry, a little bit Northern Exposure. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's that's lines, and I, you know, I'm so grateful that I landed here 22 years ago. Wow. You know, it's been a great, great place for me. As you know, as, as has the you know Greater Boulder area. Have, have you been anywhere near the Marshall Fire? No, but the Diamond Heart group house burned down. And my friend, there was a caretaker's house there and a friend of mine lived in it. So, yeah, it's, it was, I mean, I'm still not untraumatized from that because I've, in the whole time I've lived here, we've never had winds like that. And we get powerful downsloping winds a couple of times a year, but those winds last Thursday were nothing I'd ever experienced before. Wow. And, you know, we, had, so fall of 2020, we had horrible wildfires, both to the North and to the South of us. And then we were on pre-evacuation for a week. So, and we hadn't had any appreciable moisture, like from August until Thursday, that last Thursday night, we'd had 1.6 inches of precipitation. Phoenix had had 1.6 inches of precipitation the last week. So that's how, you know, we were way drier than Phoenix. And so we were just so, you know, having had horrible fires the year before, you know, we all knew we were just one down power line away from having that be us. Mm. But it it's incredibly sobering. I mean, of course, I know a number of people who, you know, know people, I mean, who lost their houses. I mean, just, you'd say it's unbelievable, but so much that's happened in the last couple of years falls into that category that, I mean, but it, it, yeah. Mm. It, you look, to me, the thing when you, when you look at the pictures of what's left, like there's no, there's very little rubble compared to, you know, well, like when you see the hurricanes or tornadoes or other fires, because the winds were so powerful. I mean, that must all be in Kansas. I mean, it's, huh. it, uh, wow. No, I, you know, I having had 
the trauma of my brain injury. And then my town was the epicenter of a 500 year flood in 2013. And then, <laughs> and then a little over two years ago, I had a knee replacement and then fell down a flight of stairs. So, you know, my, my capacity for holding trauma, I'm, I'm aware of my capacity. And so I've been traumatized enough just by the wind, even if there hadn't been fires, but yeah, I'll, be very gentle with myself going anywhere near there. You know, and the place that I practiced for 17 years with Diamond Heart. I mean, I was there numerous times a month, one whole weekend a month, and then a night or two a month, you know, for 17 years. Oh. And then it's just burned to the ground. Oh. Well, but the so, Diamond Heart survived. Well, of course, because it's a... You know, it's like if Zen Center burned or if Tassajara burned, you know, of course, you know, Zen Zen doesn't go away just because if Tassajara burned. But, yeah. you know, and it's it was just two buildings, so much less of a place than, say, Tassajara. But, you know, it's still for those of us that practice there, a very meaningful, sacred space. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well. So yeah, I. <laughs> it'll be you know whenever I see it, it'll have a strong impact. I mean, how could it not? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, dear. Uh, okay. And, Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, this is our last goodbye. <laughs> we've had. All right. We've had other goodbyes, uh, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but that was great. Thanks a lot, and um, yeah, uh, we'll be in touch occasionally. I'm sure on Facebook. Okay. I appreciate being asked. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your your uh, complying. All right. <laughs> bye bye. So thank you most kindly, Misty Brackett. Uh, nice picture of. Sangha there, uh, helping to encourage you. Uh, you know, one, one function of Sangha is we encourage each other. And so they're helping you, they're, help, they're helping to encourage you, and you're helping to encourage all of us to uh, practice our way with integrity and energy. <laughs> Okay, so this has been a Cuke Audio podcast. I'm D.C. Booba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, coming to you from Sleepy Sanur with Dog at Bandita, Feline Cuchita, and very soon, dear lovely Katrinka, who should be in quarantine in Jakarta right now, but... I'm making this podcast before her plane has even taken off, so we'll see. And we're wishing you and yours and all of us, including that bird outside. Bum, 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 bum. I think that might be a cuckoo. Oh, I always forget. Anyway, we're all wishing you and yours and all of us a grand awakening. <laughs>